Psalms 34 uh, this evening. Uh, we're on lesson 16. Well, it's lesson 17 in, in our entire series because we had an introduction that's not in our books. But it is page 33 in the books if you're following along in the books. Psalm 34. The actual verse that is under consideration is verse 20. But we are going to be taking a look at most of the psalm. Uh, let's read, Naomi, why don't you just get verse 20 of Psalm 34. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Okay. Now, in our previous study on proper Bible study, it would be pretty poor for us just to grab a verse like this and say, oh, this is what it means. Now, we know there's a New Testament verse that refers to this one that we will look at a little later. And so, in this instance, we'd say, well, but the, we have inspired commentary in the New Testament uh, that, would, um, that would tell us what the meaning is. But let's go take a look at the psalm itself. I'd like us to see what the psalm is talking about, uh, and then we can take a look at how it is messianic, or at least that verse is messianic. Uh, let's start. Uh, we, I will join the reading because we're going to read the entire psalm, which is 22 verses. We will do seven verses each. Naomi will start. She only had one verse. So Naomi will do one to seven. Henry, eight to 14, and I'll finish the chapter out. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast to the Lord. Let the humble here be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. Oh, uh, kiss to and see that the Lord is good. Last days are men who trust in him. O fear the Lord, you are his sins. There is no want to those who fear him. The young narrows neck and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not neck any blessing. Tell me, you children, listen to me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is a man who desires life and now many days? That he, he, uh, that he may see good, keep your tongue from evil, and your lips from from speaking to sin. Depart from you and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him, shall be condemned. Psalms 34 includes a great number of blessings that are available for the person who gives God a rightful place in their lives. Verses 4 to 6 talks about seeking the Lord and the Lord hearing him. That's quite a blessing. We, we, we often think, well, God's everywhere. But he does have him promise to hear everyone. He promises to hear those who seek him. And, and so that the Lord, uh, the Lord hears those who seek him should, should provide us great comfort 
we shouldn't feel abandoned by God if we are seeking him, if we are going to him in prayer. Verse 8 to 10 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Because when we trust in the Lord and we, we follow what, uh, what the scriptures say about God, we will wind up in the end in a better position than we would otherwise. Doesn't mean physically we'll be rich or powerful or, or any of those physical blessings. We might... God might bless us in that way, but he might not. He will bless us spiritually, though, for those who trust in him. And we will be more contented. doesn't matter if we're rich or poor. If we trust in God, we're going to be more contented. We're not going to be worrying about as much. We, we, we shouldn't be naive. We shouldn't go and say, well, God will do everything in the end, and I'm going to sit here and do nothing. But we trust that God will bless the work of our hands. That if we do what God desires us to do, that God in the end will bless us. We'll make sure that our needs are taken care of. Verses 11 to 14, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Being taught what the Lord desires is great blessing indeed. We don't have to wonder what God expects of us he has revealed it to us and if we will come to him through his word we will be able to know okay the lord approves of this or the lord doesn't approve of this i should want to be found in the things that the lord approves of because the eyes of the lord are on the righteous god is looking and sometimes we think well god's looking therefore i better be good God's looking and is pleased with the actions of the righteous when they behave righteously. That should comfort us. The Lord is there, that he is listening to us, that he is seeing us. He is present. Sometimes when children start wondering about the love of their parents that they have for them, sometimes they, they feel that way. Because they don't feel their parents are ever around. Their parents are working, are always working. They're always at school. And when they're at home, they don't seem to want to do anything with their children. Don't want to pay attention to anything. Kid brings home a good report card. Oh, well, that's great. Nothing, nothing celebratory about that. Kid succeeds in doing something that they've put their mind to. Oh, well. Good for you. Child's going to say, well, what's, what's that about? You wanted me to do this, or this was a good thing, and I get nothing, no show, no sign of love or, or, or being pleased. God's not like that. God sees us. He hears us. He is near to those who have a broken heart. He is able to comfort us. He is our Father. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, the Lord is not the cause of many of the afflictions of the righteous. Satan is the cause of the afflictions of the righteous. Those who he tempts to sin and those who do sin, that's the cause of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord is able to deliver us out of affliction through Christ. He is able to do that. He delivered David. He delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He delivered Jesus. Jesus died, yes, in the end, but God delivered him. Delivered him from death. And that's the ultimate promise that we have, that even if we die in the Lord, God is able to deliver us out of that. And so when you take a look at Psalm 34 on the whole, you might come away reading this psalm and perhaps the verse in verse 20 and regard uh, with little regard to it being messianic. 
In the context, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of, his, uh, out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. No, nothing really there that would say, ah, oh, yes, that's Jesus. I can see how that's messianic. There's nothing in the context that would point us that way. And yet, the New Testament is quite clear that this psalm is about Jesus. And if that's all we know, that is good enough to come along and say, well, the New Testament writers inspired of the Holy Spirit tell us this psalm is about Jesus. We don't have to argue with them about it. If I got up here and said this psalm is about Jesus and then went to the New Testament, couldn't quote you any verse from it, I say, well, th this represents this, this represents that. If I couldn't come along and show you passages, you're going to come away saying, Jeremy, that might have been a nice idea. I can see the connections, but I think that was a lot of speculation. I believe that was a lot of opinion. And because of that, I don't know how useful it was. And there are some preachers that do that. We need to be careful that we recognize if we draw a conclusion that is speculation, that we make sure we say that it is. This is why I believe this is so. That allows the audience to come along and measure that and say, you know, that makes sense, but it again is speculation. So I'm not going to lay all this doctrine on top of speculation. But when the New Testament writers quote it, we better sit up and take notice and say, ah, God is telling us something. Let's go to the New Testament, to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, and we're going to get verse 36. Naomi will get that for us uh, in, in, in uh, John 19, verse 36. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Okay, again, if you have a Bible that has italics there, not one of his bones shall be broken. You, you, if you have an italics there, it probably has a footnote or a, a side note where it will tell you, go to Psalm 34, verse 20. It might have some other verses that we'll deal with in a moment that would maybe somewhat explain uh, what's going on, but the scripture that's being quoted is Psalm 34 and verse 20. But just like we did in the Old Testament, let's get the full context of what John is saying here in John 19. We're going to uh, start at verse 31, and we're going to read through verse 37. Henry, you want to get 31 to 34, and Naomi, 35 to 37. Therefore, because you did what says, preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. And that the Sabbath was a, was a high day. The Jews asked the tenants that their necks might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came, and broke the necks of the force, and the other who was crucified with him. And when they came to Jesus, and saw that he was already dead, then and they did not afflict his necks. And one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately, uh, immediately blood and water came out. He who saw it and bore witness, his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones would be broken. But again, another scripture says, they will look on him for whom they have pierced. Okay. So, we're talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, we know that. On Friday, most of denominational Christianity will be observing Good Friday and then on Sunday, Easter Sunday. We don't observe it here as holy days, but it's supposed to commemorate the death 
the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. We commemorate that every Lord's Day. But we know from verse 31, and if you read the entirety of John 19, John is trying to give us a picture of something. To, to get us to note the similarities of the Jewish feast of Passover with the crucifixion of Jesus. Many people wonder, what day did Jesus die? Jesus died on a Friday. We know he died on a Friday. It is the preparation day for the Sabbath. That Sabbath was a high Sabbath. And there are people who come along and say, well, it was a special Sabbath. He could have died on Thursday because they're trying to get three days and three nights to, to fit literally uh, rather than accepting that is a figure of speech to talk about parts of three days and three nights. Recognizing that it's a totality. Friday, Saturday, Sunday is three days. It's not literally talking about 72 hours. Some people go back and say, well, he died on Wednesday to try to get three days and three nights because they're, they're focused on the nights, even though they come up with too many days. But the reason that the Sabbath that day, that year was a high Sabbath was because there's another festival going on. It is the, fe the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Those things happened at the same time because in Exodus chapter 12, they both occurred on the same time. The Passover was when God told the, to the Hebrews to kill a lamb, put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils, eat the lamb, roast it by fire, uh, eat, eat everything in one night with unleavened bread because the angel of death was going to kill all the firstborn sons of those who did not have the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and lentil. And the very next day, the Jews, or the Hebrews, they weren't Jews yet, the Hebrews were let go by Pharaoh. And they were told, do not, they were to take bread, but it couldn't be leavened bread because that would take time. They needed to take unleavened bread so that they had something to eat when they, uh, as they left. And so the Feast of Passover commemorates the passing over of the angel of death. And the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast of, uh, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, represent, or reminded Israel of their exodus from Egypt when they could not eat unleavened, or when they couldn't eat leavened bread. The entire festival was eight Days. The Feast of Unleavened Bread was seven, and the Passover added the eighth. The, uh, the, the other thing we need to realize is that the Jews don't, or the Hebrews, didn't calculate days the way we calculate days. Right now, it is 737 on Wednesday night. However, if I was a Jew, it is 7.37 on Thursday night. Because my day starts at sundown. My day does not start at midnight. And so my days, depending on the time of the year, would start at a different time. So in other words, the sun sets, the sun sets at 5 o'clock here in the, on the shortest day of the year. If it was 5 o'clock on Wednesday night, it would be 5 o'clock on Thursday night if I was a Jew. Realizing that is important for understanding when the Passover starts. The lambs for the Passover were killed in the afternoon of the 14th day of Nisan. The afternoon. It's eaten at sunset just before sunset. That means that the lambs are killed at the end of the 14th 
day of Nisa. Not the beginning. They are not eaten on the 14th day of Nisa as the sun sets. No. That means the lambs would have been killed on the 13th day of Nisa. They are killed on the 14th day in the afternoon, around 2 and 3 o'clock. The lambs are then prepared, and it is eaten as sun goes down. And the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a high day. It is a holy convocation day when the Hebrews would worship the next day. The entire, we'll, we'll talk on Sunday about this, maybe a little bit more about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and scribes. The reason they didn't want to go into Pilate's house, where Pilate was, because they didn't want to be defiled, otherwise they wouldn't be able to eat the Passover. Because the lambs were being slaughtered that day. Christ was on the cross that day as the Lamb of God. And so, understanding that the Sabbath day was a high day. It's saying that that Sabbath is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. By the way, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread doesn't always fall on a Saturday, and it is never called a Sabbath. The seventh day is a Sabbath. The only other day that is ever referred to as a Sabbath of rest is the Day of Atonement. That's it. If you ever read of a commentary saying, well, this was a Sabbath, Saturday was Sabbath. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a high day, but it was only a Sabbath day because that was Saturday. Modern commentaries want to make the point, oh, well, it, was, it could be any day. No, it was Saturday that coincided this year with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you don't notice the calendar, Passover is not this weekend. Passover is until mid-April because the Catholics and the Jews don't agree as to when to count from the full moon. The Catholics count the first full moon after the spring equinox. Well, the first full moon was last Thursday. or No, it's 22nd. Today is the 27th, so... Anyway, the first full moon was the 22nd. That's why... It, that's why... Uh, Easter is in March this year. It is the first full, it is, it happens on the first, second Friday or whatever, after the first full moon, after the equinox. Whereas the Jews have a different way of calculating, because they calculate from the new moon. Um, I think it's the full moon, it, it could be the new moon, but for the, for the Catholics, if I quoted that wrong, I apologize. Whatever the case, the Jews calculate differently. So that's why Passover and Easter, they sometimes co coincide, but sometimes they don't. But Passover can be any day. Whatever the 14th day of Nisan, if it's Monday, it starts Monday. If it's Wednesday, it starts Wednesday. This year it started Friday. And we can know that from John 19, being a Sabbath. You might say, well, why is that important? Why did we spend 10 minutes doing that? Well, because I believe John is not only making the application from Psalm 34, but he is also intending for us to see something else about the Passover. John, through all the way through John 19, has been talking about the relationship of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the crucifixion of Christ. The language is there. It is not always as easily present in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it is in John. How important is it that Christ's bones were not broken? Because he's the only gospel that mentions it. The only one. If the events of the life of Christ did not correspond to what had been prophesied, we would have the right to question whether Jesus was the Christ. It may appear to be a small point, but it is important enough for John to have dealt with it. And I believe he also is pointing us to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 7. 
Naomi, you, you want to get 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Henry, you want to get Exodus 12, verse 46. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Cleanse not the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. All the way through the book of John, he is the only of the gospel writers that refers to Christ as the Lamb of God. We talked about it in Revelation, our Revelation study on Sunday. Bill brought that up, that the book of Revelation refers to Christ as the Lamb of God. The gospel writer of John is the only gospel and the only epistle. Uh, and none of the epistles refer to Jesus as the Lamb of God. The ESV adds lamb in our prize over lamb. I'd be interested to figure out if the New American Standard does the same thing. Because the New King James just has our Passover. It's not wrong. But the, Paul makes the point. Jesus was our Passover. He is being sacrificed at the exact time that the Passover lambs are being slaughtered. Think about what the blood of Christ does for us. The blood of Christ, when applied to our soul, God will pass over and forgive our sins, will not cause us to die. Christ was the Passover lamb. His blood is what enables us to have the forgiveness of sins. It is not speculation on my part that Christ is typified as the Passover lamb. Scripture says so. But there's something about the Passover lamb that we sometimes overlook. Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. Now, Henry, you got... Yeah, Exodus 12, 46. Yeah. Exodus 12, 46. You shall not eat the cattle on any of the flesh house at the house nor shall you break the wild piece of bones. We, we often talk about the lamb, how it has to be a lamb without blemish, but not one of its bones is to be broken, either killing it or beforehand. That's not how you were to sacrifice it. It was a lamb truly without blemish. We shall not break one of its bones. And so, since John is typifying for us Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God, I believe that's why he is the only gospel that mentions this scripture from Psalm 34, about not one of his bones shall be broken. Christ truly was the Lamb. They thrust the spear into his side, outflowed blood and water. He was nailed to the cross, but that's not what's being referred to as the bones broken. What, what um, breaking the breaking of bones did, you have to imagine, you're hanging on the cross. You, uh, you, 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 the way you stayed alive is you would pull yourself up to gasp for air. Because you're drowning. In, you're, you're internally drowning in blood. Your internal organs are shutting down. And with what little strength you had, you were going to be able to pull yourself up. But you ha in order to pull yourself up, which is painful in and of itself because you have nails in your hands and your wrist. It's not just your shoulders that you need to be able to do that. You need your legs as well. Because if you don't have your legs, if you don't have any strength in your legs, it's like you're trying to kick off. So what they would do is they would break the bones of those on the cross in order to make it so that they could not do that. And if you could not do that, you would die. And you would die rather quickly. 
And they were doing that because, again, this is Passover time. For the Jews, they didn't want... Uh, they didn't want uh, dead body, having to deal with dead bodies uh, on the Sabbath day, especially since that was a high day. They wanted it done before the day changed, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They wouldn't usually have killed someone on that day. But again, the chief priests wanted Jesus dead before the people knew what was going on. And so they broke even their own traditions against putting people to death during the feasts. We'll talk about that on Sunday as well. But they definitely didn't want dead bodies. And so they would break the, the bones of the people who were on the cross to get them to die quicker. Jesus was dead, though. So the, there was no need to break the bones. It was not desecration to the body that the Roman soldiers were after. They wanted death. He was dead already. Now, it was, indign it was an indignity that the spear was thrust through. But again, that is fulfillment of Scripture too, from Psalm 22 and verse 16. They shall look on him in whom they've pierced. But they didn't break the bolts. Jesus fulfilled being the Passover lamb in every way. He was blameless without sin. He was, his bones were not broken. His blood was shed. And spiritually speaking, his blood is sprinkled on the hearts of all those who come to Christ in faith. That is what John is getting at. Psalm 34 does not look like a messianic psalm, <clears throat> but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John is telling us that psalm that God delivers the righteous, always looks upon the righteous, blesses the righteous, knows exactly what's going on in the lives of the righteous. That's about Jesus too. Jesus was fully righteous. God didn't forget about him. He knew exactly what was going on. And that psalm's about him too. Not one of them, not one of his bones was broken. I'm not ashamed to...